Okay, back up a little bit and fill you in where I, where I see the flow of the letter. You know what I do. I, I, I'm giving to you my understanding of the, the thought flow. Okay, so at least I hope I say it clearly enough. You can see how I understand the letter, and then you can weigh that and see if you think I'm on track or not. In chapter 3, verse 3 through the first part of, of verse 5, James refers to the, the great influence of the tongue of teachers, the great influence that their tongues have on the spiritual course of the community of faith, the church. So their tongue, the teachers, have a tremendous influence, and we can never forget that. And then in the second part of verse 5 through verse 12 of chapter 3, he uses that reference to the tongue's influence to then turn the discussion to the division that exists among his readers. So here you have, the, there's a great deal of division among these Jewish Christians who are scattered outside of Palestine. The, the tongue, he says, it's not only influential, it's also very destructive. It's also, it's, it's very destructive. And he rebukes them for using their tongues to curse one another, which is incompatible with the nature of a Christian. I mentioned this idea of cursing is this wishing ill on someone. It's a subset of hostility and ill will, where I, I want something bad for you. Why? Because I'm, I'm resentful or angry or hateful. or that. It's just an expression of that. And so he says that is completely incompatible and inconsistent with the nature of a Christian, that one would, one would engage in it. Then in chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, he continues this instruction regarding sins of division by warning these brothers and sisters about envy and rivalry. And I, you see here, I mean, he, we don't often dwell on those, but he's giving us you know, a, a significant portion here of these sins of envy and rivalry and it's because they're so damaging. And we often don't even recognize them. But they're very damaging. And he, re, he, he continues that instruction. He, re, he rebukes the attempt. Now, this 13 to 18 is, is tough to hand, get a handle on. I explained last week how I, I understand it. I think what he's doing, he rebukes the attempt to excuse or justify these sins as appropriate exercises of wisdom, telling them that true wisdom divine wisdom, God's wisdom, exhibits itself in humility, not in envy and rivalry. So here they are, they're, they're, they're engaging in envy and rivalry and all the things that flow from that. And it looks like they're boasting about it in the terms of saying, oh, this envy and rivalry is really an exercise of wisdom. It's not something bad. It is wisdom that we're employing. It's not envy and rivalry. And he says in any so-called wisdom that justifies envy and rivalry is demonic. It's, it, it's a demonic kind of wisdom and not true wisdom, not divine wisdom. See, this is obvious from the fact that the fruit of envy and rivalry, he says, is disorder in every evil practice. Given that's what comes out of envy and rivalry, any, any idea that says, look, this is wisdom that, is, that envy and rivalry disguises wisdom, he says that has to be demonic because look at the fruit of envy and rivalry. It's disorder in every evil practice. And on the other hand, the fruit of peace that comes from divine wisdom, from that unity and harmony that flows from true divine wisdom that expresses itself in humility, the fruit of that is righteousness. So we talked about that last week. Then in chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, he says there that the conflicts and quarrels occurring among his readers, that they're rooted in an envy and jealousy that spring from frustrated desires. He's getting to the root. What, what is behind this? And he says it's these frustrated desires. Because they don't have what they want, they hate and are filled with jealousy. They want something they don't have, and that then expresses itself in this hatred and jealousy, which then leads to what? Quarreling and fighting. You know, they're struggling with each other, quarreling and fighting about different things. To the extent these frustrated desires are for things needed to serve and glorify God, he says you don't have those things because you don't ask God for them. If you had asked God for them, he would have provided those things. And then he says that to the extent the frustrated, the frustrated desires are for things to indulge your pleasures, you don't have those things despite asking God for them because God doesn't honor such selfishly motivated requests. So then he, he tells them about it. Then in chapter 4, verses 4 to 10, which is where we, we ended last week, he calls them to submit to God, and that's where I want to pick back up. He says, adulteresses, 
Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever decides to be a friend of the world is made an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture speaks in vain? Now, there's a translation issue here. You know, you can translate these things different ways. I'm giving you the way it makes most sense to me, what I think, where I think the question mark should go and that kind of thing. So if you're reading yours and you say, well, how did you get there? You can ask me about that later, but this is, I'll talk about it some when I go through it. But he says here, or do you think that the Scripture speaks in vain? The Spirit which He caused to dwell in us longs enviously, but He gives greater grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the arrogant, but gives grace to the humble. Be subject then to God, but resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloominess. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Now this to me is is a, a powerful section here where James, he issues this clear call to repent of the sins he's been describing. These sins of division, this quarreling and fighting, this envy and rivalry. These kinds of things, he tells them that you need to repent of this. And adulteresses, when he he addresses them as adulteresses, and this is an Old Testament uh, term, this adulteresses is an Old Testament allusion here to the the unfaithful people of God. That's that's what adulteresses means. It's an old allusion there to the Old Testament, the idea of unfaithful people of God. You are stepping out on God. You see, when he calls them adulteresses, he says, look, this idea wrapped up, and they would have understood that. See, his readers had embraced the hostility and divisiveness of the world. That's not how the church is to be. You're acting just like the world in your divisiveness and in your hostility. And, you know, they they had done that, and they were thereby, what, being unfaithful to God. Living that way, embracing the divisiveness and the hostility of the world, you were thereby being unfaithful to God. And that's why he he refers to them as adulteresses. And they were seemingly oblivious to their spiritual infidelity. They're over here cheating on God, giving their allegiance and their loyalty to the world as opposed to God, breaking faith with God and it seems like they're not even tuned into that. Now, this is consistent with the, the moral blind spot that I suggested uh, they had with regard to their sins of anger and e- evil speech in chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. There, where they're sitting here, it seems like there they were saying, yeah, yeah, no, no, these guys need to be uh, taking care of the poor, you know, the widows and orphans. Yeah, that's right. And that they weren't really tuned into their own blindness in their own pollution Uh, with the world, and James calls him out on that. Now, he tells them plainly that whoever decides to befriend the world is made an enemy of God. You see, whoever, it's a choice. Whoever decides to befriend and and team up with the world has been made an enemy, is a person's made an enemy of God. He says, Scripture does not speak in vain, and that's how I take this. Or do you think the Scripture speaks in vain? Well, what scripture is that? I think he's talking about the scriptures that say God is a jealous God. Do you think the scripture speaks in vain when it says God is a jealous God? For example, in Exodus 25, 34, 14, Zechariah 8, 2. You see, he tolerates no adultery. He's a jealous God. Here you are hopping in bed with the world. You're you're an adulteress against God, unfaithful to God. Do you think the Scripture speaks in vain when it says He's a jealous God? He doesn't tolerate adultery. It's no small thing to treat God that way. So we asked him, he says, do you think Scripture speaks in vain? Now, friendship in the Greco-Roman world was much stronger than our sense of the word. Now, maybe, you know, sometimes we can use the word with a very powerful thing, but we've kind of generalized it. And it's a very broad, general term. See, we speak casually of friends, but in that world, there was an essential equality and unity of friends. It was a much stronger term than ours. Ancient writers, they said that, uh, Luke Timothy Johnson says, they said that friends are, quote, one soul. 
You can find ancient writers referring to friends in that concept that way. That they, quote, share all things in common, end quote. That they, quote, saw things the same way, end quote. And that a friend is, quote, another self, end quote. So you see something of the bond and the closeness and the unity. So when he sits here and says, when you've become friends with the world, when you come over and embrace the world consistent with the concept of friend, when you do that, you're an adulteress because you're being unfaithful to God. Now that, to me, puts new light on John 15, verses 14 and 15, where Jesus says, you're my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father I've made known to you. So I just like that, the idea when you see something of the depth of friendship in the Greco-Roman world, then you see this idea of Jesus employing this and saying, friends, I just like it. Now, Douglas Moo comments in his commentary. I, there are a number of commentaries I, I look at. Douglas Moo is a well-known New Testament scholar. Uh, I like his commentary a lot, and I like a lot of them. But he says, uh, we have no evidence that James's readers were overtly disclaiming God and consciously deciding to follow the world instead, but their tendency to imitate the world by discriminating against people, you know, dishonoring the poor man, by speaking negatively of others, chapter 3, 1 to 12, by exhibiting bitter envy and selfish ambition or rivalry in 3, 13 to 18, and by pursuing their own destructive pleasures, 4, 1 to 3, amounted to just that. James, as it were, wants to raise the stakes so that his readers see their compromising conduct for what it really is. God tolerates no rival. When believers behave in a worldly manner, that demonstrates that at that point their allegiance is to the world rather than to God. Now see, this is a thing that that we have to be willing to say these things. You know, I understand that a world that is... that looks at God in this way as kind of a a self-help program. The key to my benefits and life and this kind of thing does not want to hear a word that breaks in and says, listen, you have to repent of this. This idea, this affair you're having with the world has to stop. Well, people don't want to hear that. But is that to test whether people want to hear it? Or is the test, has God said it and we need to present it? You see, that's, that has to be. That's part of being faithful. Faithful in, in, as a messenger, faithful in teaching, we have to do that. So you see that, and, and James has no reluctance in doing that. Now, this, in verse 5, now I follow commentators like James Ad, Adamson, Sophie Laws, well-known. Uh, Adamson is a new international commentary on the New Testament. Sophie Laws is in the Black New Testament commentary series. I follow them in understanding panuma, the word spirit, and seeing that as the subject of of chapter 4, verse 5b, the second part of verse 5, as the subject and identifying it with the human spirit. So you can translate these things different ways. I see this as he says, or do you think the scripture speaks in vain, question mark, referring to those texts that say God is a jealous God. Do you think those scriptures speak in vain? And then it says the spirit... I take that spirit as the subject of this sentence, and I understand it with these other commentators as referring to the human spirit, and he says, the spirit which he caused to dwell in us longs enviously, but he gives greater grace. You see, so in my view, James is saying that, listen, despite your characteristically human affair with the world, through envy and its related evils. In other words, when he says our spirits long enviously, the human spirit that God has given us longs enviously, meaning our spirits gravitate toward the world. Enviously has these negative connotations for it. So I think he says, listen, your characteristically human fact here, characteristically human affair with the world through envy and its related evils, Your spirit gravitates toward that, but despite that, you see, God is willing and able to provide grace that is sufficient to overcome that sinfulness. In other words, he says, look, the spirit which he calls to dwell in us longs enviously. It gravitates towards these things. I understand that, but, 
but he gives greater grace. See, he provides a grace that is able to overcome that sinfulness. He provides that in our lives. And because of the availability of this overcoming grace that is available from God, because of the availability of that overcoming grace, Scripture says, that's why it says here, he says, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, therefore it says, God opposes the arrogant but gives grace to the humble. It's because of the availability of this grace that is sufficient to overcome our gravitation toward the world and our lapse into sinfulness. It is for that reason that Scripture says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humility before God is the condition for receiving this overcoming grace. See, he says here, he says, He gives greater grace, therefore, the Scripture says, God opposes the arrogant but gives grace to the humble. Because this grace is available to overcome this gravitation toward the world and fall into this sin, because it is there, Scripture gives you the condition for receiving that. And the condition for receiving that overcoming grace is humility. You see, one must humble oneself. That is the key, that is the important thing, you see. Humility before God is the condition for receiving the grace. And this isn't anything new, is it? And what's David say in Psalm 51, 16 and 17? He says, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do you see this idea? This this idea of humility, brokenness? That is the key to receiving the grace of God. They have to shake off this self-righteousness that they have. The idea, you see, they have this blind spot, and I'm guessing it's engendered in part by their perceived superiority to their oppressors. It's always easier to miss my own sin and to justify myself when I think there's somebody out there who's worse than I am. You see, so I'm looking at these people who are jumping on me and, oh, I can point out all this stuff. They don't care for the poor. They're not doing this. Look how they're breaking all these things. and all. That. The whole time I have this tremendous blind spot to my sins of division, my sins of hostility and evil speech, all of these things, envy and rivalry, that, he doesn't, you know, that, that they, they don't, are, aren't able to see or are not seeing. You see, so they have to shake that off. James says, look, you have to shake off this self-righteousness engendered, I think, in part by their perceived superiority to their oppressors. And what do they have to do? They have to humble themselves before the Lord. They have to humble themselves before the Lord. That's what he calls them to do. They're engaged in all these sins of rivalry, envy, all of these things. And he says, you must repent. Repent. You have to humble yourself before the Lord. See, through repentance, they will receive what? Exaltation by God's grace. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. You see, I mean, this this is the idea. None of this kind of stiffness and no, 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 resist, resist. Here comes the word of God breaking into your life, calling you out, identifying your sins. Now, what is your response to that? Who's James to write that way? Who's he to say that kind of thing? Or is it, oh, I'm the man. Is that it, you see? And that's what he's saying to them. That must be the response when the Spirit of God, the Word of God drives into your heart. Don't fight it off. You must open your heart and be convicted. And then what do you do? You humble yourself before the Lord. You see, you come before the Lord Seeking mercy and forgiveness. No arrogance. No attitude. No, who do you think you are? You know, I'm really not that bad. But just mercy, Lord. Mercy. Do you see that brokenness? Brokenness. That's what he tells them. He says, listen, that's the key. And then he says in 11 and 12, he says, Do not speak against one another, brothers. 
He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. And if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's one lawgiver and judge, the one who's able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? You see, he tells them, listen, as fruit of that humbling that he's just called them to, all of this division, this envy, this rivalry, this quarreling, this fighting that exists among them, he calls them to repent and to humble themselves before God, and as fruit of that, he says, they have to stop speaking against one another. They have to stop speaking against one another. Can the church hear that message? You see, what do we do? It's, it's like this stuff just, yeah, 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 I hear that, I hear that. What would happen if churches heard this and responded the way James is calling them to respond with repentance and brokenness and humility and stopped it? Do you think it would change things? Do you think your experience of Christianity would be different? Do you think the body of Christ would be different? Do you think it would be blessed? I think so. And he tells them here that they have to stop speaking against one another. See, to condemn or to put down a brother or sister for violations of my personal standards. That's how I understand this concept of judging. See, when I simply communicate the standards of God, I'm just a messenger. I'm not a judge. But when I condemn somebody for violating my personal standard, my taste, not God's. You see, when I I wind up doing that, you see, it's then I'm criticizing and judging what law? The royal law. You see, the royal law that says in 2.8, you shall what? Love your neighbor as yourself. And do you see here at the end of 12, he says, but who are you to judge your neighbor? You see, your neighbor. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. Who are you to judge your neighbor? You see, when I sit here and I put down, when I condemn a brother or sister, talk against them for violating my personal standards, when I judge them in that sense, I'm criticizing the royal law. Those who sit in judgment of that law, he says, are not doing the law. They're not submitting to the royal law. You should love your neighbor as yourself. But what are they doing? They're putting themselves above that law as judges. That's what happens when we reject something. God says, here is, here is the Christian ethics. Here is the standard. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, when you violate that, You are sitting in judgment of it because you're saying, that's stupid, that doesn't apply, I don't need to follow it. What are you doing? You're judging the standard. You see, you're putting yourself above it. And you're saying, no, no. Instead of just coming under it and doing it, you're rising above it and saying, that doesn't apply to me, that should know, he should know better. You see? That's what he's talking about. When you act that way, that's what you're doing. You're not submitting to it. You're putting yourself above it as a judge. And he says God is the only legitimate lawgiver and judge. They have no business usurping his role as judge. Nobody does. That's all our society wants to do. All our culture wants to do is to put itself in place of God and to say, no, I will call the moral shots. I will reveal what is true. I will tell you how you can live and what's acceptable. Forget God. I'm God. Listen to me. If I say through certain cultural channels that this is acceptable despite what God says, well, then it's acceptable. What are they doing? They're judging God. They're saying, no, no. Who are you in this standard? I will take this standard and throw it down and say that standard is not enlightened. That standard doesn't come up to speed. That standard is from olden age. And I'm going to judge it and say I have a much better path. Listen to me. Okay, there's only one lawgiver and judge. You see? Only one. And it's God Almighty. And so we need to submit to him. You see, we need to submit to him and not wrangle with him and fight and say, no, this is how it is and I want to do this way. He says in 4, 13 to 17, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to this city and spend a year there, carry on business and make a profit, who do not know the course of tomorrow. What is your life? 
For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. I always think of steam coming out of a kettle. It's, this is your life. He says, what is your life? For you're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But now you boast in your pretensions. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows the good to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now, in 4.13 to 17, I think James is addressing wealthy believers. Okay, there's debate about that. A number of commentators agree with that. But uh, so this group he's writing to, these Jewish Christians, are predominantly poor. Okay, we can see that. They're being oppressed by their unbelieving rich neighbors. But it seems to me that there are at least a few relatively wealthy people included in that group. And I think he is addressing them here. He's addressing these wealthy believers who has demonstrated by the certainty with which they spoke about their business plans, they lived under the belief that they were guaranteed tomorrow. That's what this looks to me to be about. He says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to this city and spend a year there, carry on business and make a profit. You The certainty with which they spoke of these things, it seems that they lived under this belief that they're guaranteed tomorrow. Proverbs 27.1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. You see, there is an arrogance in this that simply says, No, 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 look, everything goes on the way it does, all this. I am guaranteed tomorrow, and here's what I'm going to do. I know how things are going to play out. I know what's going to happen. I will go to this city, spend a year there. I'm going to carry on business. I'm going to make a profit. You see, it is not simply the idea of doing that. It is the sense that that's going to be something that's guaranteed. You see, this idea, this false certainty that they hold to. Now, that these merchants are Christians, at least it's indicated, suggested to me, by the fact that James chastises them for failing to look at life from a Christian perspective in verse 14. He certainly wouldn't do that to unbelievers. He urges them to acknowledge the Lord's sovereignty and providence as they make their plans, he does that in verse 15, and he suggests that they know what they ought to do in this matter. He says that in verse 17. So those things smell to me like he's writing to Christians here. Okay, so I think these are, these are believers who are Christians. I don't think James would address non-Christians that way. And those, that those addressed are probably Christians. That's this view is shared by Peter Davids, Douglas Moo, Burdick and by Blomberg and Kamel in their recent uh, commentary. So it's not an odd view, but there are different views on it, okay? But I think that's what he's doing is he's addressing here wealthy uh, Christians, the few that I think would have been scattered among the, his audience. And he exposes this attitude that they're manifesting as an arrogant delusion. You see, that's what he does. He says, look, this is an arrogant delusion. The fact of the matter is, is, is that their future is in the Lord's hands. Everybody's future is in the Lord's hands. And to boast as though the future is in our hands is evil. To think that we control the future and that we're the ones who have the power to determine the future is evil. Douglas Moose says in his commentary, he says, the world is not a closed system. And this, of course, goes against uh, you know, post-enlightenment modern thinking. You know, this puts you in the troglodyte class in terms of how our, our society looks at things. But this is biblical. You see, he says, this world is not a closed system. What appears to our senses to be the totality of existence is in fact only part of the whole. This life cannot properly be understood without considering the spiritual realm, a realm that impinges on and ultimately determines the material realm in which we live day to day. You see, that's, how, that's reality. That's reality from a Christian perspective, a biblical perspective. We are not a closed system. We are not simply matter and law in action over time. There is a spiritual reality, and the future is in the Lord's hands. It's not in our hands. The future is in the Lord's hands. 
So he exposes that as an arrogant delusion. Now, the connection with verse 17, it's not obvious, I have to say. Right? He goes on and he's saying, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll live and do this or that. But now you boast in your pretensions, all such boasting is evil. Then he says, therefore, you go, okay, therefore, to the one who knows the good to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. All right, well, when I'm studying, I'm looking, I say, okay, therefore, <laughs> the connection. <laughs> you see, I want to see the connection. Now, it's not obvious, but Sophie Laws in her commentary, I think she's on to something. Now, given the fact that, that tomorrow is in the hands of the Lord, and the fact they don't know his plans, they can't justify not acting today on the basis that they'll act tomorrow. Because the future is not in their control, it's in the Lord's hands, and because of that uncertainty, they cannot justify not acting today on the basis that they'll do it tomorrow, they'll get around to it. They have no excuse for putting off till tomorrow doing the good they knew to do. More specifically, helping their poorer brothers. Oh no, yeah, I'll take care of that later. 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 You see, and they're not guaranteed later. And that's, that's, I think, is the point. Now, that may seem like a stretch, but this concept is present in Proverbs 3, 27 and 28, especially in the Septuagint version, the translation of that. Proverbs 3, 27 and 28, I think this is from the NIV. It says, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow, when you now have it with you. And then the Septuagint adds, for you do not know what the next day will bring. I think that's the connection. Why he goes and and he says that. And in fact, James has already appealed to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, in chapter 4, verse 6. So he's kind of in the ballpark. You see, so I think that's what's going on here. So when he said they, they wind up saying that, say, therefore, this is what is, you cannot justify not doing the good that you know you should do today and are able to do today and just put it off He says, because you don't know what tomorrow holds. You see, so it all ties into that same kind of idea. Then he says in chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, he says, Come now, you rich people. Weep and wail over your coming misery. Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will serve as a testimony against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Look! The wages of the workers who reaped your fields, which have been withheld by you, are crying out, and the cries of those who reaped have reached the ears of the Lord of armies. You lived a self-indulgent life on the earth and live luxuriously. You fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You condemned and killed the righteous man. He does not resist you. Ooh. I'll tell you, how does that go down? How does that go down in 21st century America? We probably want to cut that out. You can't, be, you can't be saying that kind of stuff. But there it is, sitting there, just looking at you. In chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, he announces the fate, now see, of the unbelievers who are oppressing the poor believers. These are the people who've been putting them down, crushing them, oppressing them, cheating them, using the legal system and their power in it to take their property, take their things. And so he lets them know, here's what's in store for you. Here is what's coming for you. He does this, I think, so the faithful see hearing the miserable end of these rich, unbelieving oppressors might not envy their wealth, which is always a temptation, and so that they may gain strength to endure in knowing that God is going to avenge the wrongs done to them. He'll make it right. I know you're suffering. I know you're getting pounded. Here you are saying, I'm a child of the God of creation. And these people are just stepping on your head. Ha! Yeah, go ahead. Hey, pray to your God. Yeah, do that. You see, what is that? You see, but he wants them to know that the God of all creation is going to put everything right. You see, he will make everything right. 
And he wants to encourage them. He wants them to gain strength to endure so they do not allow the oppression to cause them to abandon the faith by saying, I quit. There's not enough in this in the here and now. I'm still getting oppressed. I'm still having difficulty. Hard to feed my family. On and on. I look around and these unbelievers are rich. Well, look around in our world. You know? People pimping this and pimping my ride and my house. and You know, well, they got come on into my marvelous place, you know. I got a $50 billion house. And I sing songs about sexual immorality and all this kind of stuff. And yet I'm very wealthy in our culture's eyes. You see, our culture has made me wealthy, put it that way. Okay, so you look around, you say, well, there are a lot of people who who don't really believe in God, and in fact, they're enemies of God. And yet, look at them. Look how wealthy they are. So there's always that temptation. See, these people, James says, they love money so much that they're willing to abuse, exploit, and even kill God's people to obtain and preserve it. Now, that's, do you see, this is idolatry, right? This is idolatry, where I love money so much, what am I willing to do? I'm willing to disobey God, mistreat people, abuse people, exploit people. Why? Why would you treat somebody that way? Because I love money. I love the money, and money is my God, and I will walk over you and chop your head off and do anything I can to get more of it and to preserve it. And he's saying to these people who've been treating these Jewish Christians this way, who've been abusing them and exploiting them, he says that, listen, you love money this way. Now, James uses the word in verse 6 when he uses the word condemned. Okay, he says, you condemned and kill. When he uses that word, it points to some kind of judicial verdict, okay, which suggests, again, that they were using their wealth and their influence to deprive the righteous poor of their rights and of their living. So they had this influence, and they're using this system to come in and just steamroll these poor people and do injustice by them, which God absolutely hates, and the practical outcome of cheating the poor out of their land and of taking away their gainful employment was that the poor would what? What would happen to them? They would starve to death. That's what he means when he says here, you condemn and killed the righteous man. You see, they would kill them in that sense. As was said, there was a Jewish writing called Ecclesiasticus. Not Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiasticus. It's also known as the wisdom of Jesus, the son of Sirach. It's a second century B.C. Jewish writing. And it says, to take away a neighbor's living is to murder him. To deprive an employee of his wages is to shed blood. You see, it is this idea that James is pulling on. This concept that in your abuse and exploitation of these poor people because you're in a wealthy and powerful position to stomp on them, you did injustice toward them. And in depriving them of their livelihood and their ability to earn and survive. That's what he says, that you killed them. You see? You killed them. And so he's after them uh, full force. They have made a fool's choice. This is what we have to hold in our hearts. They've made a fool's choice. See, though they enjoyed luxury for a time, right? They lived high. Look around you. They were rolling. They lived high. I mean, drug dealers got a lot of money. Right? And that's the big thing. It's all about money. Doesn't matter how you earned it. Anything. As long as I got money, that's the big deal. Well, just look around, and that's what these people had done. They'd enjoyed luxury for a time, but the material things to which they had devoted themselves, they will not last. They won't last. No, no, but I got a wonderful house. I got a grand car. I got all this stuff. I got all this stuff. What's going to happen to it? It's not going to last. And he's saying these people have made a fool's choice. They have chosen money over God. And that is a fool's choice, you see. The temporality of these goods depicted by their rust. The temporality of these things depicted by their rust will testify to the foolishness of that choice. I gave my life to things that in the end are what? (laughs) 
why did you live where I live for? No, you live for. That's what you gave your life for. That's what you served was something that becomes rust. And in the end, their idolatry is going to bring God's wrath upon them. See, the rust of their goods will consume even them. You see, it's like the idea that all these material things are rusting and rotting and decaying and falling away, and it's going to come and consume you. You've made a foolish choice. You've chosen these things over God Almighty. You're familiar with this concept. I mean, this isn't unique to James. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Now there's great gain in godliness with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. What drove these people to mistreat these people? Love of money, baby. <laughs> That's what it was. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Why did they wander? I want to serve money. What did Jesus say? No one can serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24. For either he will hate the one and love the other, be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Only room for one on the throne. And it has to be God. And what were they serving? Money. And you see what they were doing. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 17, 19, As for the rich in the present age, let me finish this, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Wealth is not inherently evil. It is not inherently evil. The love of wealth, making wealth an idol is, because you then serve it rather than God. The key here, he says, look, these wealthy people, they were a blessing to the church. They've always been a blessing to the church. But they are to be do good, be rich in good works, and be generous and ready to share. Not an idol, but they have this wealth and they share it. And then it is a blessing to the church and is used in service to God. I heard that bell. Thank you. <laughs> 